Hello, I'm Sandra Murray of the White Mountain Community Garden and welcome to Arizona Mountain Gardening. We've had some snow up here in the White Mountains and our garden beds are all tucked in under a great layer of snow and our attention in the garden turns to planning for the next year. This episode is all about getting ready. We're going to be talking about seeds, how to start them, what we've saved from last year, planning our garden, and also how to take care of those tools. Let's get ready and enjoy the episode. of year is a great time to look at what seeds you may already have as you're starting to plan your garden. Many of us have a lot of seeds that we've had year after year. How about Funny. you Vicki? You mean like these? Okay yeah. Yeah and these? That's quite a few seeds. And these? Yeah. 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 My problem is I can't go into a nursery or a garden center and go buy a, a seed rack without taking about oh, you know, at least five packets, and this is what happens. Yeah. Well, because uh, there are a lot of seeds in there. But um, we found a way to check the viability of the seeds. Uh, a lot of seeds actually do last a long time. The only seed that only lasts a, a year is the onion seed. And didn't you say some lettuce? Yeah, I had read also lettuce seeds may okay. only be viable for a year. But I agree with you, if there's a way to test it, we that have, is a great idea. We have a wonderful way to test okay. it. Okay, so we're gonna check the viability and this is how you do it. Take a paper towel, wet it down, and put 10 seeds. Oh, that's not, can't tell very well, can you? They're tiny. Six, so we'll get me like four more, my dear. Put it down. Put it in a plastic bag. Just tap water. We'll just spray it. Put it on a window seal. It doesn't need any direct sun, but just let it sit for a few days and germinate. Well, you're going to wait and see how many sprout. Right. And the math will be easy because there's 10 seeds. So if we have five seeds sprouting, we know 50% viability. So even if you have a 50% viability, they're still worth putting in the ground. You might want to plant them just a little bit thicker. Right, so we're going to label this. It's arugula, and these seeds are from 2010. Oh my gosh. Well, seeds are pretty this sturdy, is, so I bet they'll the still be seed. viable. So it's February. This is about the time when you want to start things growing indoors. So what we do is we take some peat moss and cinder sand. And the cinder sand is uh, it's very coarse, but it's for um, giving good gra uh, drainage to the peat moss. So I'm going to mix it up. So we'll mix it all up and put it in the and put it in the uh, in these cells. Getting a little messy here. Just fill these cells up. Okay. 
I'm going to wet down the peat moss in the, uh, in the cells to get it ready for planting the seeds. So these are seeds from uh, the seed garden. So I'm going to plant, I'm going to do some starts of um, these tiny yellow cherry tomatoes. So what I'm going to do is just put a few seeds in each cell. Okay, maybe I'll do, I'll do six, six cells. I have a little garden, so I'm not going to start a lot of tomatoes. So I use this um, chopstick. I use this chopstick to just push the seeds down a little bit and cover them. So they're already, the peat moss and cinder sand is already moistened. So this will get the, give them a good start. Bunching onions, which I love. They're uh, green onions, scallions. So it's good to get them started now. I might be a little late, but I don't think so because these are actually spring onions and they'll mature fairly quickly. So again, I'm just gonna scatter a few seeds in each cell. And then just press them in. So now I have six cells of tomatoes and six cells of spring onions. So what I'll do is I'll just put a few more things in here. I have um, endive and Swiss chard, or maybe I'll just use some uh, red, um, red mustard, which is one of our favorite plants. Oh yeah, I have some radishes. I can do the radishes too. It's a more of a cold weather vegetable. So I'll put some radish seeds In here. These are French breakfast radish seeds. plant, a red mustard, and uh, it does really well in cold weather. I think the tomatoes will be okay, too. Because everything I'm starting is indoors, I'm going to put them um, under a grow light and a heat mat, and I'll show you how that's done. Okay, so now um, I've documented when I'm starting these seeds. And um, once I have this down, I know where the seeds are and I, I will make labels to put on each area so I know what plants are growing when because you really need to label. Okay. So, all right, so now this is really important. So what I'm going to do is transfer this uh, to the grow station, which you'll see there's a, a grow light up above, and there's some styrofoam to keep the uh, to protect the seeds uh, from absorbing any kind of cold. And this is a heat mat, which is really important for the seeds because it gives the, the seeds a chance to germinate in a really in warm soil. 
And the soil should be about 70 degrees. And this mat is actually calibrated to heat up to about 70 degrees for growing. I might want to lower this light a little bit, but this is basically the setup for growing uh, starting seeds inside. My name is Steve Campbell. I'm with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension here in Navajo County. And we're going to do a segment today about garden tools, yard tools, and taking care of those tools, but primarily on sharpening. Because a sharp tool is like a sharp knife, it gets the job done. And when we have dull tools, we work harder and we break things. So I think first off what we'll do is just kind of go through the tools that we're talking about and then get into the actual sharpening aspect. The tools that are most important to be sharpened are our, our pruning loppers. They get a lot of work in the average landscape. And all of our tools that we use as far as pruning are what we call bypass. We have a hook. We have a sharp moving blade that comes across the hook. And so there's a couple things we have to do is ensure that this nut right here is tight, but not too tight so that we get a good move across the, the hook. The other thing is that we do lubricate them. 3-in-1 oil does quite nicely for that. And then when we're done with them and before we put them, we'll we make sure they're clean and dry. Now we've got two different kinds of pruning shears here. A lot of people, you notice I've got, I keep this one in a sheath to protect the blades, but these are for your hedges and that type of thing. If you notice, you can hear the movement across, again, keeping this nut snug. We have the small pruners, which same type of thing, a hook and a blade, spring loaded so that they actually open in your hand every time you use them. And again, lubrication and tightness on the nut. And you'll notice I keep this in a sheath so that it doesn't get, you know, rusted up or lost. And then we have the pruning saw. You notice it's slightly curved inward, which allows you to go over the limb or whatever you're cutting this way. We don't sharpen these ourselves. This is called a razor tooth setup. And this particular saw, is designed for green wood and what it does is each one of these teeth has a little bit of twist on it. They're sharpened professionally. That widens the cut so that this part of the saw doesn't drag in the cut. We call that cut the curve. So a lot of people will use a bow saw which is used for cutting dead dry wood. You put it on a limb and you get in about this far and it starts dragging because the kerf is no wider than the blade. So that's a very important factor. Razor tooth, yes they cost a little bit. That's why we keep it. And that saw always is in the sheath because we want it protected. This is more for roses and flowers. It's a double bypass. Both are actually moving depending on which way you hold it and so there's no hook and uh, blade on that one. Finally, the two garden tools or portions of garden tools that are always ignored are the hoe and the shovel. A hoe needs a good sharp blade, as does a shovel, and it takes a little time to sharpen. Most people will think of, a, well, I've got one of these grindstones in the garage or I'll go get a grindstone. Actually, this is your best tool for sharpening. They come in different sizes. I've got an 8-inch and a 6-inch here. They're a mill file. Uh, they don't cost a lot, but if you pay more for them, they're going to last a lot longer because a file lasts as long as the hardness of the metal that it's made of. And we don't like to be trying to sharpen something with a file that's worn out. It's just going to be a very frustrating experience. So that, that is a, the only two tools that I use are the files, like I say, 6 inch, 8 inch. And if I'm going after a shovel or a hoe, I'll probably go to a 10 or a 12 because I want to really get some good uh, cutting edges on it because I'm going to have to spend a, quite a bit of time. Now, why do we sharpen sh a hoe and a shovel? 
because when you buy them at the store, they're not sharp. They're gonna come with a, as this one has, a little bit of a flat edge here. The other thing to look at is when you buy one of these, this particular pair here, not sharp at all, has never been sharpened since it was bought or purchased. So again, uh, just because it just came from the store doesn't mean that it's ready to be used. First thing I do with a hoe or shovel when I get it is get that nice sharp edge on. And it can be as sharp as a kitchen knife almost. The only difference is, as I finish with the file, I don't go to a stone or a uh, ceramic sharpening rod. Well, now it's time to get down to the sharpening side of things and to kind of talk about how the average property owner can do it safely. And one of the key ingredients to safety when you're working on sharp tools is a pair of gloves that you have good dexterity in. In other words, the fingers are not loose and grabby and the leather surface to protect your palm and your fingertips. As we look at these, like I say, these are primarily used for trimming roses and flowers and other types of plants. And this is a double bypass. Every tool will come with a sharpened edge at an angle. And we like to try to continue that angle as we sharpen. For a small tool like this, we'll use a uh, six inch file. And the key thing is, is to work with the same edge that's already on there and just work against it, not with it. And what we're trying to do here is just get that edge sharp. Doesn't take a lot. And then we take the burr off the back, the glove comes off, and I can just touch it and it's sharp. I don't want it, you know, we're not trying to make this thing a kitchen knife. We want it to just work and do a good clean cut. And this is, has two points. Number one, it helps when you're cutting the plant to do a nice clean cut because it heals better. And if it's sharp, not as much effort is required. So we have this side done. So now we go into this. Notice how I just kind of hold this. It's a freehand type deal. There's no, and you can kind of feel as you're working the file across there. You can see the angle that was on the tool when you bought it. And you can feel as it starts to really smooth slide, you know you're getting that edge where you want it. And then take the burr off the back, reattach the spring. Clip it shut. And we have a tool that's ready for flower cutting and roses. The next size up is for small limbs. And in most pruning, if we buy new trees, uh, plants, shrubs, bushes, this is where 90% of your pruning would take place with a tool like this, because you want a tool that you can cut early with. Use this side next to the plant so that you leave a short, short uh, stub. The key thing, if we do 90% of our pruning here, we don't have to use the bigger tools and we hardly ever have to use a saw. The larger tools in the saw for me is when I come in and there's a tree that's been in the ground for five years and nobody's found to prune it or worked on it, then I have to do some of the heavier type duty. But the average tree that we plant, 90% of your pruning is right there with this pair of tools. Again, we have that little angle on it that we work with. So I get it like this. And a lot of it is feel but you can see the entire edge as I work around it. And I'm not putting a lot of pressure on this. I'm just kind of letting it work across very easily. Now this particular pair of pruning nippers has not been filed since it was bought or purchased. And so what I do is I just follow the same angle that was there in the store. And one nice thing about these Coronas, they do come sharpened. This one has a few nicks in it. So what I do is look at this side. Take any burr I had off. Clean off the hook a little bit, just a flat file there, just to kind of take any burrs or stuff off of that. 
you can see now it's kind of shiny there. If you feel that, it's kind of just like a kitchen knife when you first do the original sharpening on it. Again, close it, hook it, because now that we've made them sharp, they can, they can cut a finger, cut an arm, cut anything else. So when we do a shovel, oh, we're going to go for a larger file. And what we do again is we work against the grain. Now, I can't reiterate enough, we don't put an awful lot of pressure on this thing. The harder we push, if anything slips, fingers are going to go into that sharp edge. So the key thing here is, is to work very carefully and bring that shovel edge down. And again, what we're after, now we've got a long ways to go on this one, but what we're after is that real sharp to the touch. Here's the advantage. You're cutting roots, it cuts right through. Uh, you're digging up dirt, it's going to cut through. You're digging into grass, it's going to cut through. And Again, a sharp tool is a safe tool. One of the things that happens to shovels is the harder we have to work with them and jam them in, the quicker we break the handle out of them. And you notice how my, I'm not cutting straight in. My hand is moving with the curve so that if I did slip, my hand's going out here, not into there. Even though I've got gloves on, I don't want to So then we turn it this way and start working. Got to get it right here. Start working across it from this side. And if you have a vise or something like this, you can set these in a vise. That can also help you out. And the key thing is, is especially shovels and hoes and these types of tools they're not going to come sharp. They're going to have a really dull edge on them. And next time you go to the store, just look through them. Another tool that you use a lot, perhaps, or maybe not an awful lot, but some, is an ax. You sharpen it the same thing with a file. Now, normally, like I say, if I'm working on a shovel, I'm going to use a, this is an eight inch, I'd be using a 10 or a 12 inch. But we're just doing this for demonstration purposes. That, And then I work the tip kind of in and of itself because that part of the shovel is where the, all the business starts, right there. Some other things that you want to look at on tools as you build your inventory of tools is your handles. Keep the handles there's some types of oil and stuff that you can use to oil the handles. It keeps them uh, stronger and they last longer. But in every, every case, we're working with lubrication, we're working with sharpening, we're working with good, good handles. I like the fiberglass handles because I've never broken one of those. I have broken wood handles, especially the long ones on some of the, the larger tools. These hedge clippers, as you can, same sharpening approach as we have with the uh, rose nippers because, again, very small branches and all of your cutting is done by a very uh, wide angle here because it's more the passage of the two blades across each other. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Arizona Mountain Gardening. We've got some great ideas of how to prepare for a wonderful growing season. If part of your plans for this new year was to have more fun, meet new people, learn how to grow food, and get some more exercise, please consider joining us at the White Mountain Community Garden. We have monthly meetings every second Tuesday at Solterra. They have a great meeting room there. We enjoy meeting each other, learning through educational programs, and find out what's happening in the garden. Thanks, and join us next time.